much more sophisticated model doesn't actually get you a better answer necessarily, and sometimes it even gets you a worse answer because there's uncertainty in all the inputs. So if there's uncertainty in all your inputs, the more inputs you have, the more uncertain your final result. All right, so we're going to kind of go through a little quick little consumer's guide to oil spill model. So first of all, we need to include both state and transport, even if transport is really effective. Um, so really, really quickly, state or weathering is how the oil changes when it's out in the environment. Um, evaporation is a big deal. Um, for heavy oils, usually evaporation isn't playing a big role, but we do have some other issues. Uh, dissolution also is another issue. Um, there don't tend to be a lot of soluble compounds, especially in heavy oils. On the other hand, that's the stuff that really is not um, And then the big but is what if it's coupled up? So Jordan brought this up. Um, uh, dill bits and sim bits are really heavy oil where there isn't going to be much soluble, there isn't going to be much evaporating, but now there's this light stuff mixed in there. So the bulk oil actually has these very volatile things. Um, and that's also true, actually, not even for dill bits and sim bits, but for some of the heavy California oils as we heard about earlier that are cut with things just to make them volatile. Um, dispersion is another major process for um, weathering. Again, that's that's not doesn't play the same kind of role with these heavy oils because heavy oils tend to be a lot more viscous as well and as we're just mentioned, break up the oil. Um, so the big question with weathering for heavy oils is how does the weathering affect the properties that affect transport and density is the big one. Um, so we need to be able to do something to kind of model the state of the oil, how the weathering is happening so we can try to see how is the density going to change over time. And that's going to completely change. Um, um, so for transport, the key question is, does it flow? Um, so the starting point is the initial specific gravity. And you know, so as Jordan mentioned, if it's heavier than water when it first spills, it's not going to flow. That's the case. Um, but the challenge is when it changes after the release. So it comes out of the floating well, um, and then maybe won't stay a floating well. And what I will say is that from a modeling perspective, our oil fate models that um, try to model the evaporation and stuff are not really calibrated to these kinds of odd fuel bits and go to that next um, So there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, we know, if you know, if you start with a bitumen, for instance, it's heavier than water, and you mix it with dillion, um, it gets very light and highly volatile. Well then, in theory, all the dillion will evaporate, and you'll end up with that heavy oil. But in fact, there's a lot more complexity going on. There's a lot of work being done on it, but I wouldn't say you can necessarily model it with certainty. Um, also, density changes as the oil cools, it is hip, shift heated. So this means it's now getting transported differently. I mentioned that thanks for the uh, um, So while the oil's floating, it's really similar to any oil spill. And it's going to act well, probably like well-weathered tar balls, but it you know moves with the wind, maybe not very quickly, but it'll move with the wind, it moves with the currents, it's very much like this. So the traditional oil spill models are really um, <clears throat> The other weathering factor is sedimentation, also brought up. Um, this, so this is a question of how sticky is it, what's the source of the sediments, um, are we picking up sediment actually like on the bottom or right on the beach? And it's in the water column. Uh, there's a lot of work being has been gone on for years, and there's a, a lot of even more going on now for um, OSA models, oil sediment aggregates. A lot of work talking about how oil is sediment aggregate. But most of that work is being done for more what I'll call ordinary or traditional oils, which is to say lower viscosity, um, higher APIs, and that's then droplet formation in the turbulent environment and how those droplets interact with the sediments. Um, but when you're talking about these heavier oils, they're generally more viscous, and so they're kind of big, thick blocks. So how does that interact with the sediment? That's not really as well. Um, and then once it doesn't flow, well, now from a transport, we can look at our lessons from sediment transport. Right? So something that doesn't float in a river or in the coastal zone is going to move like you know, sand doesn't flow. Right? 
with similar. Um, one of the issues is you do have these sort of near neutrally buoyant levels. So if it's very close to the density of water, then it's going to move like suspended sediments, and that means it moves with the currents. So we can actually do that. That's that's pretty good modeling. If we know that the oil is fairly neutrally buoyant and staying suspended in the water column, uh, we can figure out where it's going to go. Um, on the other hand, if it's really denser than the water, not close to neutrally buoyant, then it's going to be sinking down to the bottom and it's going to move more like what's called bed load instead of the transport world. And that's the sand and gravel at the bottom of a river or a beach that is getting kind of resuspended and pushed along as it goes. Um, there's a pretty well established literature for traditional sediments, both for sort of beach transport and river transport. Um, but even that literature is actually, there's a lot of uncertainty in sediment transport. It's very hard to figure out sediment transport rates, um, even when you know a lot about the sediment properties. Um, and you really need to know parameters like particle size and density. Um, so this brings up this question of droplet size. If any of you are kind of following the oil spill research literature, people are always talking about droplet size and droplet size distribution. Um, so there's an enormous amount of work that goes on there. Um, and Essentially, that's because droplet size is key to a lot of oil spill fate and transport issues. Um, but the droplet size depends on the turbulence regimes. You have to know something about the wave climate or the river turbulence. And then it depends on the viscosity and the intracational tension of the oil. Um, however, non floating oils tend to be pretty viscous. So that means they're going to form really, really large droplets. And maybe the point where the droplet isn't really the right word anymore. Globules. Our balls. Um, and all this work on droplet size distributions isn't looking at that. They're looking at lighter oils, thinner oils, what's going on, blowout plumes, what's going on with the surface and the wave climate. And mostly because what they really want to know is which droplets are getting really, really small and they're going to then disperse really well. Um, so for non floating oils, it's just as I said, the transport is very dependent on how big these blobs are, and yet we don't really have a good way to model how big they are. Um, so talking just a little bit about transport at the bottom, the shields number comes from the sediment transport idea. It's basically the ratio of the shear stress at the bottom of the river or ocean um, to the buoyancy of the particles. So the buoyancy of the particles depends on the density and the size of the particle. So you get this nice little plot. Um, and it shows, so you, if you know your particle size and your density, you can see whether it's going to move along as a bed, whether it's going to move as a suspended transport, or down here, and whether it's going to move. So, is there a shield number for oil on the bottom? Well, it's a function of bed shear stress and buoyancy, so we know, uh, we know the density of the particle. However, buoyancy is also a function of droplet size, so we're back to this, what is the shape and size of this oil on the bottom? Um, and really a sort of shield number for oil is going to depend as well on viscosity, potentially even the stickiness of the oil, how thick is the layer on the bottom, how big is the layer? We have a big wide expanse for the turbulent environment we're working on for a while that might be something. Um, so this is a really complicated problem and we really can't model it from the first principle. So there's some work going on right now. I think Nancy Pinner's on the uh, phone, and some, she's supervising some students at UNH that are doing some lab experiments to slide and kind of come up with how to parameterize whether oil will move based on the flow conditions. Um, but we're really not there yet, so we're kind of guessing. So I'm going to use an example of this. Uh, Jordan talked a little bit about the DBL-152. This is a slurry oil, which is just weird, weird stuff. Uh, but it's very heavy, and we say it's not very viscous. Well, it's not very viscous for a very heavy oil, but it's still pretty viscous, this oil stuff. Um, and it basically, most of it just went to the bottom, uh, and it got into these like, little sort of snake-shaped things that settled into the ripples on the bottom. But it was just kind of hanging out in pretty much the same area for a while. They were about to go. They had divers down with vacuums. Just it up. Um, this isn't about 15 meters of depth. And the currents weren't very strong, so there wasn't enough energy to really move. Um, but, you know, would a big wave event work? Potentially. In 15 meters of depth, uh, you need substantial energy at wave periods greater than about five seconds. The longer the period of the waves, the deeper this motion is felt. Five seconds is not a very big wave, not a very long wave. Um, 
Um, so we're definitely going to get that kind of energy out of Delta Mexico. Um, but still, how much? Um, so I ended up doing some analysis on this where I transformed the wave climate at the surface to what the wave energy was actually at the bottom. So we look at the energy at each frequency, and each frequency actually transmits. So this is net energy at the bottom. Um, and what happened during that event was the spill occurred. I really wish this punch would work. Um, in here somewhere, and we had a couple of storm events where they actually had to shut down operations because it got unsafe out there. And after this storm event, they came back out, and the oil was pretty much where it had been before that event. After this event, however, the oil had massively moved. So where did it all go? Right? So now we actually have some information. We know that this is not enough energy to mobilize that oil. And this is enough energy to mobilize the oil. So there's, there's a bit of a gap there, but it gives you some idea that somewhere up here around, this is very weird units, but um, um, 10 meters squared per this. Um, the thing to note about this is that this, this is the energy at the bottom. If you actually looked at the wave action and the wind speed at the surface, it wouldn't be nearly as pronounced. And that's because the wind direction was quite different, and these were much longer period waves than those. So this was sort of just as nasty at the surface, but not nearly as long as the bottom. But then if you look over a whole year of this sort of total wave energy at the bottom, that spike that moved the oil was down here around 10. So it's not at all unusual to have that much energetic. I think this might have been <coughs> yeah. um, It's called Ida. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, but hurricanes aside, we're definitely hitting sort of any kind of good size storm. So and that particular oil at that particular location is going to get mobilized. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have these relationships where we can actually predict with a model what these values are. We just have to kind of wait and see what happens. So this informs us. Um, you know, if if we happen to spill a similar oil, then I'll have some idea what to be thinking about. Um, so what you can do with modeling depends entirely on the availability and quality of the inputs. This is really, really key. Um, so the kind of inputs we need, uh, known is NOAA's uh, oil spill transport model. Um, we need to know the initial position of the oil. That's actually often uncertain, especially on day one. Um, we need to know the wind. Now, for not floating oils, wind doesn't have nearly the same kind of influence, so that's not the <coughs> um, And then we need something about what the river flow is like, what the ocean currents are. Um, and we have some response models we use to help produce uh, things about ocean currents. There's a lot of operational models now for ocean currents uh, supported by groups like the Navy and NOAA and some academic institutions. Um, what's available is just completely variable by region. Uh, NOAA's been working hard over the last couple decades to have operational models for the ports, mostly to support navigation. Um, but even so, depending on where you are, there might be some really great models running and they're not. Um, and then you just uh, can be flying pretty blind. Um, for not floating oils, it's pretty much all the same limitations, although once oil gets into the water column or at the bottom, now we need to know about the currents in the water column and at the bottom. And all of these models are much better at the surface currents than they are at the bottom, because that's what we can actually see and we can simulate data from. Um, so we do the uncertainty in the models for <coughs> down low, it's going to be always higher for not floating oils. A lot to be thinking about. And then what we actually do depends on what the questions are and when are these answers needed. So I mentioned briefly that I often use this quick tidal excursion model. Um, and that's because the question is something like about how far, where do we have to look for this oil tomorrow morning? Um, and they want that answer right away. They don't want to be spending time fiddling around with computers and gathering data, doing all this stuff so I can run a model. Um, they need an answer now. So we want to use Simple, quick model, something we can calibrate. Um, just a quick mention, when we talk about oil spill modeling, there's, depending on what kind of answers you're trying to get, you end up using very different tools. And I work on the response side. 
uh, of the NOAA house. Um, and so I care about these kinds of questions like, where's the bulk of the oil going to go and when will it get there? Because that's what the responders need. They're trying to plan their response. And I'm doing a model forecast. Uh, mostly what I'm trying to do is inform the response about what, what should they go do tomorrow in the next day. Um, on the other hand, if the damage assessment people come in weeks, months, years later, and are trying to figure out what the injury was to the environment, um, <clears throat> they need to know things like what concentration of organisms exposed to, for how long, and these kinds of details, um, and what sort of ultimately to get to what kind of harm did it cause. Um, but <laughs> That, fortunately, is also a much longer process, so they can spend a great deal more time gathering data and calibrating models. Um, I think for not floating oils, the, on the damage assessment side, it's, it's really going to be the same challenges. The models themselves are, are uh, more limited and more reliable. Um, so when you're getting model results, if you're the consumer of the model, you're in the command post and somebody, Jordan comes in with this forecast. Um, you also want to be thinking what, about what we were thinking. What assumptions actually went into this model? What was the resolution? Um, and what kind of accuracy and validity? Uh, we certainly try to uh, present this information when we prevent a model result. Um, <clears throat> and this is all the same thing for non floating models. Same kind of question. Whenever you get a model result, yeah, what, what assumptions went into it? This is your time. Working again. Wander off. <laughs> um, so this gets us down to the forecasts need to consider uncertainty. It's really, really critical. There's always uncertainty in our models, and we need to consider that. We need to have a handle on it. We need to present that to the people who um, so how do we also want to constrain that uncertainty as much, as much as possible? So how do we do that? Uh, On-scene observations, absolutely critical. Um, we need to know what's going on out there, and that includes both observations of the environment. <coughs> so if there are, you know, weather buoys out there telling us what the wind is doing, occasionally they'll actually be alive. Real-time current meter above Texas, some place they have a um, <coughs> current meter is operational off the coast. Um, <laughs> um, HF radar. Actually, you guys in California have great um, HF radar. So. Then we can know what the currents are doing. HF radar doesn't give a forecast to drive our model, but it can. We can compare what the HF radar is doing to what the forecast model is doing. Oh, how well the forecast is. If they're not doing very well, that cracks the uncertainty. Um, Another thing you can do is use an ensemble approach. If you have multiple models, you run with the multiple models and see how different the answers are. That's strange uncertainty. We did that a lot in the Gulf of Mexico, Deepwater Horizon. Um, however, that was a really rare case. The Gulf of Mexico is sort of studied up the Indian. So there were, I think, seven operational models that we could compare and work with there. Um, Something like five of them were sort of always operational, and another couple of people sort of brought up and made available specifically to support, support that incident. That is very rare. And, and only when you have an incident that goes on for three months are people able to actually spin something new up. Um, so, again, the observations are really critical to model. You know, our initial forecast always has a lot of uncertainty because we haven't had the observations yet to prepare. And the inputs are even more uncertain. That's where the oil got spilled and how much got spilled, all that, what kind of oil it is, all of those are really uncertain. Um, so once we get observations back, the uncertainty goes down. We can calibrate the model. Um, I thought <laughs> that this stuff was going to get pushed by the wind really quickly and travel 10 miles over the first day. Observations come back and it went six months. Okay, we can crank down the image, calibrate the model a little bit every next day. Um, so this really works great with floating oil because we can see it from the air. Uh, someone flies a helicopter over there, they can map out where they see the oil. This gives us really great information about the oil. Um, and increasingly there's remote sensing systems. If satellite analysis is getting better, airborne systems, Judd's really on top of that. 
Um, <clears throat> so we can get this great observation, and then we can calibrate our model with that, and we can produce better forecasts the next day. Um, when the oil's not on the surface, it's really hard to see. You can't just look at it from an airplane or a helicopter. Um, so it's much, much harder to calibrate. This is a little segue into what Jackie's going to talk about, um, I think, next, um, about we need to now be able to detect what it is. But even the detection measures we have, if they work well, are not just take one picture and get the synoptic view. You have to kind of look. And then we have to craft the output to the audience. So again, who is your audience? What questions are you going to try to answer? You have to make sure we can create model result outputs uh, to answer the questions and express them to So we a little bit about uh, floating oils. So uh, I got to talk before Jackie, so I got to be here to punch on this. Um, she always says I've never been in the same spill twice. And that's totally true. Every spill brings you to Jackie. Um, however, what NOAA, OSPAR, the entire response community brings to every spill is a wealth of experience with customers. And even though each one is unique, there are also there's things we know. And this helps guide our expectations. It provides reality checks on the model. It really helps us kind of, we know what's happening. Those floating oil spills have been pretty rare. So we just don't have that same wealth of experience. It's, we're even more sort of likely to be surprised by what happens. Uh, so here's an example of that. This is the Apex 3508 that Jordan mentioned. Uh, this is a slurry oil and a barge and a crash. And we got the SDS. That's what we have. Um, and so this is little snippets from uh, what we wrote up for our first thing. So the specific graph is 1.1. So we thought, all right, it's going to um, and we mentioned that slurry oils can be quite variable, and the MSCS is often generic. So this is part of what I mean about crafting the results and expressing your uncertainty. So whoever's reading this knows, oh, okay, this is being based on assumptions that we know are not very good assumptions. Um, and then we're going, well, but the data in that MSDS had a pretty low viscosity oil. So we said, well, we expect this oil to break up into droplets fairly. So a few millimeters in size, that kind of droplet is going to stay suspended in the water column and get transported back. Um, so here it is, right? That turbulence in the river will keep much of the oil suspended in the water column and droplet form. So we're thinking that turbulent oil is going to be moving downstream close to the river oil. Um, and so we can give an estimate based on that of where we think the leading aid is going to be based on the flow. Um, and then again, if there are substantial deposits on the bottom, maybe they'll get remobilized if the river flow. All right, so what really happened? Well, most of it went down right near the spill. Um, I think Jordan mentioned that there was a big chunk right where the original collision was, and then another chunk where the barge ended up getting pushed up against the shore and stabilized. Um, and aside from the initial sheen, there wasn't much seen downstream at all. So the assumptions that went into this, what were the oil properties? And it completely changes what we have in that forecast. Um, turns out the oil was more viscous than what was in the SDS. So that completely changes. It didn't break up into those oil systems. So they didn't stay suspended. Um, I think it might have been a little more dense than the was as well. So even more dense, more viscous, completely different trend. It was heated, so as soon as it cooled. Right, I think maybe it cooled faster than we thought it would. I mean, maybe the viscosity numbers in the SDS were based on the shipping temperature rather than any. I don't actually we go back to sort of compare the final numbers. <clears throat> so that initial assessment was really based on past experience. Previous slurry oil spills we had, what had gone on, um, and it turned out it didn't actually steer to the right direction. So another issue about non-floating oils is the sensitivity of these properties. So oil's behavior in transport environment is always affected by properties like density and viscosity to some extent of oil. Um, but for floating oil, you can vary those properties a fair bit, and the transport behavior is pretty simple. It's, it floats, it floats. It's on the surface. It's going to get moved by the currents. It's going to get moved by the winds. 
denser, heavier oils get pushed by the wind a little less than lighter oils, but that's the difference between moving at 3% wind speed and 2%. Not the difference between going somewhere from 3 With non-floating oils, however, the density tends to be pretty close to 1, and that means a very subtle difference in the density to make the difference between it floating, it staying suspended in the water column, or it sinking to the bottom. So we need to not just know approximately the density, but exactly the density. And the density is changing as the oil weathers. So it's really, really hard to know, even if we know exactly what it is when it's spilled, knowing what it's going to be a couple days later after the fire is very difficult. Viscosity also tends to be pretty large in these other wells. Um, and then the viscosity affects how large and certain droplets are globules. So again, Really big chunks, highly viscous stuff is going to just sink to the bottom and stay there. If it gets broken up into smaller droplets or globules, it can get suspended water column and be transported a long way. So where the oil ends up is ends up being really, really sensitive to the stress as well. Um, so Yankos, another example, the Jordan drop. Uh, API 13.6, that's getting to 10, it should float in fresh water. Um, but some of it kind of seemed to stick to the bottom. It was really weird. There was this sort of trench um, that just sort of had oil in it. And I'm pretty sure they took some samples from that. And when they took the sample out and you know went to the shore and put it in a jar, it just And what we ended up with is a lot of these kind of globules being transported downstream and what being suspended in water column. I mentioned that if you have something a little bit heavier than water, in a turbulent environment, it can get suspended. Well, it's the same thing, actually. If it's a little bit lighter than water, it'll tend to want to float. But if you're in a turbulent environment, it can get stirred down. And again, it ended up suspended in water column. Um, couldn't really be seen. However, the nuclear power plant downstream, their cooling water intake started to get turbulence. Um, this is not good news for nuclear power plants cooling water. Um, <laughs> So they ended up having to shut down, and then they came to us and said, when are we going to be able to turn back on again? So this seems like this is kind of question modeling. Uh, but unfortunately, we had a pretty good idea how globules were moving downstream once they were suspended in the water column, because they're moving in the water. Um, but the source was a little strange. It's like, why were we continuing to get more and more tarballs? We had oil that had you know, landed on the beach and it's getting it suspended. It might have been some of this oil pack. Getting resuspended. So we didn't really have a handle on the source, and so it was really hard to say <coughs> when is it going to stop. Um, another example is the tank bar MM55, which was a heated asphalt. Anyone heard about that? Um, turns out that while it was hot, it actually did float. So it was kind of moving out of the barge, and then there would be some big mats floating downstream and then slowly kind of breaking up. Um, and I think, in fact, some of them did seem to pick up some air or something in the way, so they ended up staying for it, and then others sank and did it mess. But again, transport's very sensitive to density, so even the density change that comes with temperature variation is um, So ultimately, it means our results from a model are going to say, well, the oil will be somewhere from directly below the barge to many miles downstream. <laughs> So, take some thoughts here. Pick the right tool for the job. Uh, some of you like to say all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. Um, and always keep in mind what questions you're trying to answer, how good the answers need to be, when you need the answers. Um, and know what questions the model was designed to answer. Um, so, you know, you could take Noah's known model and you could plug in the properties of a slurry oil or a gilded, and click go, and it'll give you an answer. But it really wasn't designed to deal with some of those questions. Um, and remember that what you want is a forecast. Forecast. You don't want a model. Work. You don't want model results. You want a forecast. And that includes this analysis of what are the uncertainties? Are we using appropriate tools? What are we using? And even then, that forecast is never going to be perfect. So plan for uncertainty. And that, as I kind of found, is still a little depressing as I went through this. That there's so many places where the uncertainty is higher for non um, That's a challenge.
Jackie Michelle. <laughs> she once told me she'd never been to the same spill twice. <laughs> and that's very true. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about, you know, we set the stage up. You know, we get the models, we get the hopefully where it goes, and now we want to be able to confirm those models. Maybe that you can get it for validation. But I'm going to talk about, this is all built on the, the work that we did for the API. And here's a look. So, uh, Jim Elliott's here. He was uh, a member of the team. <laughs> Bill Key, he's an Arsona guy. But we had a really good group of folks who were kind of very operational, like trying to develop to provide guidance on what techniques you might be able to use, might be able to use, be able to detect oil both on the bottom um, and moving in the water column. So there, you know, here's the list of things that we have. These are the tools in the toolbox. That's well, you know, that's there's nothing, you know, there's lots of things that, that are in laboratory in development, but these are things that we can really, you know, maybe splash tomorrow. Um, their sonar systems, underwater visualization systems, diver observations, sorbents, you know, barishly crude, but you know, we use them all the time. Laser chloro sensors, visual observations by trained observers, bottom sampling, and water pond sampling. I'm going to go through kind of quickly each of those. Again, um, a lot of detail in the technical report and the upside that will help guide you with that. And boy, I tell you, I'm a big believer in sonar systems. So for years, you know, um, uh, you know, they, they were, when people talked about, oh, it took so long time to get the data, but no, hey, that's all changed now. You know, you know, I can sit on a boat and look real time at the, you know, at the output and make decisions, like we did during the Vigigio spill. A lot of good capabilities, no water clarity issues, there's georeverence, got high resolution these days, um, high rates of coverage. I mean, it's like it's a dream technology. Um, but there are some limitations. You know, the sonar can't see below the sediment surface. It all is buried, and I'll show you some images won't be able to see the oil. Um, there's a certain minimum size. And, and also, all sonar systems, you know, they're, they're remote sensing. You know, everything has to be validated. You, know, you, don't, you don't really know what you're looking at until you collect additional information. And there's quite a bit of experience in the response community. A lot of folks have these systems and know how to operate them. So in the report, um, in the guide, and in the technical report, you know, we kind of go through the different kinds. You know, there's side scanning sonar, there's multi feed um, echo sounders, there's some sub bottom profilers or chirps that actually can see buried oil, maybe. Um, and then there's the uh, freaking scanning sonar system, which is much too hot. But you know, these things are great. The only problem with them is that they all require some kind of ground truth, and only the, the sub bottom profiler has a chance to. Uh, you know, this is just shows you the, uh, the aerial coverage in square kilometers per hour. I mean, you're not going to do that with almost any other thing. Actually, synoptically map something on the bottom. Uh, so, the visualization techniques, there's all kinds of there's still cameras, acoustic cameras, um, video, and then there's something called the spy camera, which takes a little picture of a small uh, window in the substrate that might be looked for um, all on the bottom. But um, uh, so these things are great. Um, you know, we, we like to see what these really look like as opposed to kind of an image that's um, from an acoustic sensor. And so, um, but there are, and so, you know, these are much more informative than looking at a bunch of you know, colored patterns on the seafloor that we get from our sonar system. These are very powerful. So the same range, I think these are all from the DBL 152 off of uh, the Louisiana, Texas border. And you can sort of see, you know, it started over, this is the 20th of November, you know, it's got bigger mass, then over time, that when the storm comes through, all those old drops, you know, that all got picked up. And quote, every, every storm comes through, it's like, oh, bad word. You gotta go find it again. And, you know, it seemed like just, we found it, we got divers on it, we got it. we started pumping, <coughs> then we all have to go back to the port and then go back find it. Then of course you put anything in the water, especially depending on the oil type. We talked a lot about viscosity, but thickness or adhesion is a really a big problem for something so uh, you know the, the uh, camera on that piece of equipment gets fouled very quickly with certain conditions to apply it. So in that area of suspension, you know, as the oil is moving around. And that's really hard to clean. <laughs> Just like you know, birds, right? Um, a lot of times we use these uh, either stationary or towed sorbents. Um, like I said, barrels and crude, because these are, um, but we, we've been using them since the first time they were ever used was in 1984 to hold up the mobile oil spill. And you talk about how change and oil responds to the change in the wind. So that spill occurred in the Columbia River, and it was just enough, heavy enough to, to, to not float in. Freshwater, but as it reached the saltwater edge, it rolled that, that, that saltwater wedge up there and then came out and stranded on the shore um, along the coast of the north, the north of the Columbus River. 
So, um, you know, it does, these things can, you know, we always think about them floating and sinking. Sometimes they can sink then float. Chris will tell you all about, you know, those conditions. So, um, so these things essentially, you know, there's something attached to a weight, and especially the toad ones. Uh, so this is kind of what they look like. Uh, we call these V-sores, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, vessel, um, fill or recovery systems. At first, we were thinking maybe you could, you could use them as recovery, but we usually mostly use them for detection. You drop them over, you know, and, and you drag dragging for a while, you pick them up and look at them, and you, and you have some description of how orderly they are. And so this is system, a larger one, it's got a petter bar with multiple chains, but you know, that's kind of, you don't just toss that over board and do your training. You have to stop the boat to pick it up, and so there's a lot of issues associated with that. So um, uh, there's little smaller ones, here's one on the Ohio River, and so you see how, how heavy all of that is. So the cold ones, the heavier ones are nice, because you, get, you know, you can make it as wide as you want, so you get a good, a big sampling area, especially if the oil and water is in nature, and it's always that um, uh, and, and you can track your lines, and, um, and again, the detail one can contribute to reduce this a whole lot. You can sort of see the expanding grid as, as, as the oil spread down current over time. But you need a larger vessel, and um, so you, you, know, you can stack things a lot more, and you don't want to something on the bottom, and all of a sudden, you know, you're not, you're not a problem to hang up. So what we've done is there's also a smaller one where you can just take one chain, toss it over, we didn't have to slow the boat down. We can put one end of the water, pull it out, and then just keep going. But of course, that's a little bit narrower, quite a bit of narrower spread um, swap area. And um, they're lighter. You don't know for sure if they're maintaining contact with the bottom. They won't bounce along. And with the only thing about both of those things, you don't know whether you hit one big patch, you know, someplace. You, you don't know if you hit a lot of little patches everywhere, or you know, if it just bounced along the bottom. You know, there's really I always wish we could put a camera up. So to see what they're saying. We want, that's one of our recommendations is to do some experiments with that so you know, not every time you put some water, but you know, testing it to see just how that thing behaves in different kinds of products. And so, so, so we drag them, but also we suspend them in the water top. Uh, this is what we call them uh, snare sentinels. So this is sort of a, a snare on a rope with an anchor and a float. And you suspend it in the water column. You know, you can have it, uh, you know, you can put a uh, uh, you know, you can see if you can catch any crabs, right, in the crab pot. And, um, but you can see, you know, those are what we call uh, snare baited crab pots. And um, during the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, video 152, you know, we were trying to understand where the oil was moving in the water column as well. And so we have multiple ones and um, we suspend them in the water and then we go out and put them after a few days, go back and pull them up and see where, you know, if they're there. So these things make escape. Everybody likes, you know, people like those uh, floats, right? Mm -hmm. To worry about high Here's an example of, you know, in addition to the problem about trying to, to predict where the oil from the apples, here's the, uh, the nuclear power plant right here. I'm oh, sorry, nuclear power plant. You can tell where that was, right? The little dots right around it. These are all where we put snare samplers, sentinels. And um, because in this case, you know, the oil, some of the oil got injected into sediments, but a lot of it, you know, some of it uh, floated, rolled around on the sandy paddle plant, picked up just enough sediment. So, you know, just barely. Buoyant and, and the current system. So it moved along the bottom. And so we were able to put these uh, once we back. So, uh, so here's uh, the 8th to 10th December. You can sort of see the, you know, the, the, this is the percent cover of oil on the, on the uh, snare. You can sort of see that it was higher up than the northern part, upper part of the river. The next period of time, you can see that slug moving down, right? And there's a new little cover like that, right there. And then, um, by the you know, mid to late December, what was this was really important because it gave the power plant confidence that there wasn't another big slug of oil further upriver that was going to come back down. This is really what gave them, gave them the confidence to be able to start maybe uh, considering restarting the power plant. So, you know, here, here's a nice snapshot of the synoptic. So you, sort of see, you get the sense of this slug of oil moving down. And this oil was in the, on the, on the top, um, in the lower um, couple of feet. We never saw any of it, even though we had it all the way up to the water column. All the oil was just moving along the bottom. So it's kind of like more like the bed loam suspension. So these things are great. Uh, boy, they're you know they're very time labor to put in there. You know they like to the escape. Um, uh, you don't know when the oil passed. You know that period they were deployed. Um, 
and uh, you know, there's no calibration, especially if there's been some work being done about some of these oils you know, that might stick to these sorbents there for a while, then they could be washed off. So, you know, the efficacy of oil absorption and persistence of that absorption. Uh, then, oh, then there's uh, you know visual surveys. You know, this is the Lake Wapabum spill here on the left, where they were using some viewing tubes. You can see the water was clear enough, shallow enough to see it on the surface. And you can kind of use scat terminology and make a little map of what, where the oil is on the bottom. Um, bottom sampling is various ways you can um, take um, grabs, you can pulling, you know, there's something we call weighting that shovel, shovel pits also. This name is not the cat, but they're sticking in asphalt. You know, during the uh, MM55 spill, you know, they actually had divers go down and just poke the bottom, and when it was kind of sticky, ah, you get some asphalt. Because you get that, there's no visible the river, was, the visibility was perfect. I got the picture of the polling because this is something that was uh, developed specifically um, you know, as, a, as a systematic survey method to find the oil on the bottom, which was the end of the spill. So you can see it's nothing but a, a, a metal rod with a, a six inch disc at the bottom, which they had you know, a very specific procedure. They would push it in so far, agitate the bottom, and then count the number of droplets or sheen that would go into the surface. And then a good scat terminology to hit definitions of what heavy, moderate, light, and none were, in terms of the number of sheens, um, and droplets, and everything else. So they used all that, and we just talked about labor intensive. This is the Chasm uh, uh, River enters into the Morrow Lake. And so, um, we do the scale here is um, not shown, but um, it's, it's not very much. I mean, this area is you know, maybe 100 feet wide or something. This is one of the places we go during one of our, um, I'll talk about the next part about the distance. But look at it. all the, you know, a lot of red there because, uh, you know, essentially all that oil that was attached to the suspended particles, and, you know, what, what does the river do when it enters a lake? Drop the slope, right? So that, this is, the upper delta, where you know, a lot of the suspended oil uh, from that form. And, and it did this every year for years. They will go out and clean this all up, you get all green dots, and go back next spring and it's all red again. Um, waiting, to, uh, waiting depth shovel pits. Um, again, you use some kind of like little shooter shovel, you reach out, you dig it down, put it low, and you just fire the oil. That's pretty you know, labor intensive too in certain environments. Um, we haven't found anything better when oil is very scattered and buried. It's kind of hard to do. You know. So again, look at this. You know, all these little dots are, you know, a GPS coordinate of a person sitting there doing a shovel pit, describing it, and putting those observations. Again, you have moderate things like standards. You let bottom sampling go. So we only have a very small area. So, um, so if it's very patchy and maybe very deeper than the sampling can go. We really have to have the statistical significance. So all those, those little dots, those are pretty significant. But we go next. Um, okay, next one. If we, you know, what else we want to use? Well, there are these uh, um, uh, underwater laser fluorescent systems. You know, they're, 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 they're very sensitive to oil. It's most often all the positive. A lot of false negatives, though, because it gets saturated. But it doesn't, you know, you can use it day or night because it's an active sensor. You know, you can a pulse out and see the response looks like. You can tell the oral type, you know, very, very specific responses, your wavelength responses, and you're able to excite that kind of oil and that kind of talk. But, you know, it doesn't, you know, again, doesn't protect buried oil, right? Um, it decreases the turbidity, distance from the target, and wave height. And it really, you know, you can't buy one yet. Yeah, yeah. So Rick, you know about that. You, know, you can't buy it, and you know, why is it on the list? Well, you know, we're hoping that there will be some you know, further development. You know, Kurt's funded quite a bit of work um, uh, with these systems, and, and you know, but it's, you know, if you're a, spe a specialty tool and also a response, it's hard to get enough funding to do that goal. You know, I, I always call these things like an Allen wrench. You know, how often do you need an Allen wrench? But when you need it, it's the only one that will work, right? So. Um, we need uh, the you know, people who will use the other tools because they don't have there's not enough money uh, to fund the development of other capabilities. In water column sampling, we're all very familiar with using barometers like the dispersed oil monitoring. And, you know, and, and those work kind of okay. You, know, you have to have dissolved or ruptured oil in the water column 
Um, my experience is I think that these heavy oils, you know, they don't release much to the water column, so it could be just laying there, not releasing anything, and you're not going to see it with the, any of these sensors, not, not the, uh, the barometers nor the you know, these amazing mass, mass specs. If you remember, the mass spec barometer used to fill like a whole room this big. Now, you know, this is um, about a, you know, a foot and a half. That's pretty amazing what they've been able to do that. You, you can put a, a mass spectrometer on a on an AUV or an RUV and you fly it around in the ocean and have it measure real time concentrations. It's pretty cool. But I don't think it's a really it's not your typical kind of tool for sunken oil because it doesn't those kind of oils don't release into the oil. Or they reduce if they they're so high like the little droplets that they can be saturated by them. Diver observations, we always need those anyway. It's usually one more Validation of what we're looking at. I was just on. But you know, they don't they don't uh, survey too fast, especially if they're you know we don't, we don't put guys uh, scuba put guys in scuba on the uh, yeah, so they, oh, they have, yeah so yeah I won't I won't tell you more about that. <laughs> but I'm gonna show you a picture that you know this is what these guys look oh, like, right? You know, oh. you know, I'm not sure what you think in an hour, but it's not enough. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh yeah. Well. Um, we talked about, yeah, there are different kinds. There's special, all kinds of materials, everything else. And, and if you have any questions about diving, you can make water. But, so if you look at all these systems, you know, here's the, the, the 28, I mean, the 38 cases that we looked at. I mean, we tried to mine everything we could find about under what conditions your oil sunk it in any way. There's a little bit, a whole lot. Um, and one thing to notice, you know, divers are almost always used. <laughs> you want to have a diver do a lot of things in there. Sonar systems are pretty much commonly used. Look, you know, look at the V-source, the sorbets. But they're good for validation. So I'm going to go through, um, and then the report, we kind of talk about all these properties. I'm not going to, I'm going to flip over that, but we try to tell you as much as we can. Every report, many words, and then these little tables, and just a few words, so you can know the attention spans from the other support. And what we've done is we've developed these top right charts. So this is all based on a lot of best professional judgment, you know, Jim and Mark Plain, I, uh, you know, sat in a couple days at RTI and said, okay, you know, you know, what are the criteria that we would look at? Everything from you know, water depth, water visibility, substrate, bottom obstructions, patch size, all thickness, query, you know, all these factors. I said, okay, well, which of these um, systems, you know, I mean, in, in general, you know, we, we don't talk about sonar, you know, side scan versus multi beam, but, uh, you know, these are the conditions, you know, these are things, the green ones are good, the other ones are maybe, and the red ones we think no. This can help you start developing that. Um, uh, ensemble of response technologies we want to use in your um, I'm going to show you an example from the refugio spill. Um, you, you, some divers from, from UCSB said, oh, we saw some oil on the bottom. You know, uh, oh, God, it's been sinking. You know, what are we going to do? So um, I came out and just had, we had the API guy that's out for the review. And so um, uh, I want to show this because we use some multiple methods. You know, we went out and did multiple metric sounders so we get the best energy. That's really important. That's a piece of the puzzle because we're looking for places where the oil might have too late. You know, this is a pretty high energy environment, so we need to have some places for the Then we had um, an ROV fly through. You know, we had a, a sonar system to be able to look for a little bit better resolution, but we tried not to do that. We went out with an ROV to look at some places, and just some divers down at some places. Essentially, we saw really no look up the oil. Mostly it was just uh, some oil coated uh, grass moving down the bottom. So we could, you know, we could see them in this area. And so, but there were evidence. You know, uh, Steve will tell you about it. You know, they had oil uh, lobsters, dead lobsters, dead animals in the near shore subtile area. Watch out! So they robbed some oil that was mixed with oil. Um, now the Apex Barge, we talked about that quite a bit. Um, there's a location map here. Kentucky, you know, and grounding, and, and they pushed it to uh, you know, This this oil, you know, it, it's. There's a surface tension component to it, you know, it can come up with kind of float for a second, but then it would go straight to the bottom. API minus 7.4. Um, and so, uh, again, here, this is the barge, this this, this um, yellow rectangle. You, you, this, this the first image was, was obtained with just a little, you know, um, uh, fish finder at first. You, know, you could really see it pretty well, but then we went back with more sophisticated surveys. And so they did both side scan sonar and the multi beam, because the multi beam is really important. Especially for any kind of removal activities, because you've got to know what the bathymetry is, the you know, right size of the equipment, and also you want to understand the transport mechanism potential. Why is it there, and when that might be? Um, we also went out and you know dropped a few snare on board to make sure that the stuff we were looking at was you know the oil. You can see how nasty it was. Um, I 
love this picture because essentially they let it they did this, this nice, you know, detailed uh, commercial grade sonar survey. There were two places where the oil was released from. This is where the first one was. Then the lower one outlined red is where uh, it was pushed up against the bank. And so while they were doing some removal, they said, well, you know, this was on the uh, 6th, so they wanted to go back out and check how it was doing. And on the 20th of September, the one on the right, what happened to this one here? The, the lower right one. So it, actually, it wasn't, it didn't get moved, it got buried. And, and, and some of this, is, you know, they've been cleaning this one up, and some of this oil moved here. You can see that some movement and some burial. You know, so, you know, this was a little bit closer to shore, this was a little bit closer to, to the south right of the uh, so, um, you know, a lot of tools are about trying to figure out where it is. Now, the, the first API report, the one on sunken oil, it focuses on sunken oil. That's, you know, on the bottom. Now, it might move. But in, in the inland guide, we were able to slip in a little bit of work on um, suspended oil detection. Uh, same kind of spotlight chart here. Um, fewer things on this one, right? I mean, so this is detection and quantification, not too many things. Acoustic sensors, barometry, optical scattering. We have a lot of questions on these things with use quotation because these are sort of not quite off the shelf. You know, they're prototypes right now. Now, Thorman's net, you know, we can still put fly cameras and divers down there. So, um, you know, there's a big problem though is when you think of moving the water column. I mean, it is really hard to figure out, you know, the water depth, the current, um, you know, how do you, what do you put in there to try to come up? Because you want a synoptic picture. You don't want a bunch of dots that you have to connect because the, everything is so temporally dynamic. Most of a lot of these environments. So, um, so uh, that's hard. And, and we want to be able to know how much. I mean, just to know there's some oil there. I mean, not, you know, we have this how much do we need to do well. So we kind of go through the, um, the advantages and considerations. You know, in the <coughs> first API manual, you know, uh, I told EPA to do it. So we had advantages and disadvantages. He said, those aren't disadvantages, those are considerations. So, <laughs> welcome to Kool Aid. You've got to considerations. <laughs> These are not, you know, we just have to consider that. And so, uh, you know, you know, acoustic sensors are, um, you know, we don't really know these are all remote sensing things. You know, we have to see that we have to the coolest picture of Ivan. Well, the reason I, I was able to jump right on that is that was Ivan in 2004. And Ivan toppled, um, uh, actually caused a mudslide in a place called the Mississippi Delta. Uh, it had a platform with 26 wells attached to it, toppled it, pushed it 400 feet downstream. Covered up, we covered up everything with, with 60 feet of mud, and so and this is the top of our jacket for the production platform. And of course, it's been leaking ever since since 2004. Okay. Every day you can see there's a leak there. And so there's been a lot of work on trying to figure out you know where this comes from. This is a, a, a sonar water column anomaly. So these, you see there's there's two of them here. You can see this one here. This is the formal well bay area. There's only gas kind of like this. Went up south. This is dry gas. This gas bubble. But you can't tell the difference that this is dry gas. This one, there's oil and dry gas. How do we know that with you know, samples? Samples were taken. But you, know, but you can still see these water column anomalies. So these are things that are, have, you know, have a um, sonification and you, know, you, you can sort of see the reflection from the sonar. Actually, and so uh, in fact, you can see even uh, this, there's an area, there's a little uh, erosional pit here that's only. And uh, you can see there's two plumes coming out of it. So I'm pretty impressed with what you can do nowadays with uh, a water column with just test. And there's fluorometers, you know, the same thing, but you know, if the oil is a bunch of little drops that are just stick next to stuff, then it's going to interfere with any kind of sensor. And I think it might overwhelm. I mean, a lot of these, these things um, you know, really aren't designed to sort of deal with you know, larger droplets. So there, I don't know how effective they're going to be if we did that for some body work. Because when they do, they have a flow cell. It's all the things, you know, if you put it through a, something, you shoot a light at it, and you want to be able to get its uh, uh, response. The optical scattering systems, they're kind of like, they're a little bit different than the sonar. Um, but, you know, and they, and Kurt, are you going to talk about this? Yeah, very briefly. Very briefly. I'll let you do that. Uh, induced polarization, this is pretty exciting stuff. Um, again, the one company that's that's sort of a spin off of the USGS efforts. And I think they have, there's some possibilities. And they're trying to, they're trying to get, um, they've done some work at waste sites with this contaminated sediments, especially produced in the charge, the present law chase for that. Um, you have to have you know, two sensors, you know, shoot off here and you can measure the response to it. Use that polarization shift. Next. 
fresh water is similar. There are a few um, nuances that are that are different, but um, you have phytoplankton, which is similar. Uh, this group I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, these are animal uh, invertebrates, um, small invertebrates, but you also have fish and the same type of food web interactions that occur in the movie. So these are um, these are two um, fairly sensitive um, habitats within um, stream systems. And the ripple is um, areas where it's a little bit more shallow. There's uh, gravel, cobble, smaller rocks, and um, it allows for uh, a lot of oxygen exchange. It's a very um, important habitat for salmonid spawning. Um, and pools are also important. They provide refugia for um, the hot summer months um, because they're deeper and they tend to stay cooler. So these are um, areas that might be uh, particularly uh, sensitive. Um, for the uh, ripples, this is um, this is a, a female um, salmon. They use those areas, and the female would will carve out a, a small depression in the in the um, gravel within the ripple area and lay their eggs, and they're called reds when they're laid. And there's there's kind of a, a method to their madness. The way they position the eggs within the red is in the downstream end on the rise to maximize oxygen exchange from the pulling water coming past um, and um, and also uh, the wash away of any um, waste that comes um, comes in that area. And so when you have a, um, a spill, especially non-floating oils, you can directly impact the, the reds um, with that non-floating oil sinking and, and covering them. But you can also impact by having upstream cleanup operations that might increase saltation and also affect what's happening with uh, the salmon reds and hatching. So um, a couple different potential impacts. Freshwater uh, column species, and um, I just put in a few examples. Uh, Rainbow trout, muskrat, and um, Pacific giant salamander, which is a listed species. And then um, freshwater benthic invertebrates. And um, I wanted to mention this is, a, this is the shast. Oh, sorry. I started to touch it. Um, <laughs> wait, can you go back? Oh, wait, I can. This is a Shasta crayfish, and it's the only um, native crayfish in California. And it's in, it's in Shasta County. And this is a common species of freshwater snail. There are quite a few of these are um, spring snails. So you have some limited uh, freshwater species, uh, native freshwater species that are bottom dwelling, that are sensitive to non floating oils. And then um, I included this because these species are already uh, suffering to some extent by some of the aquatic invasive species that we have in the state, like the frog mussel, beaver mussel, and museum mussels. So um, oiling in these habitats is uh, particularly um, detrimental to some you know, the few native species that we see in the benthic environment of freshwater. Um, benthic macroinvertebrates are, you know, to break it down, living on the bottom. They're large enough to be seen with the naked eye, but they're still small, and um, they're invertebrates without a backbone. And so what we, why these are important, I'll show you in a second, but they look like this in the environment. The way you collect them is you put in a, a frame, a quadrat frame, and you rub the rocks to get these off. Um, you stir up the bottom sediments, and everything floats up, and you have your net downstream to catch it. And so um, you, you collect them, and you sort them from all the detritus and other debris, and then you classify them based on, um, down, sometimes down to species. So it's a whole process. Why do we care about benthic macroinvertebrates? Because they are particularly susceptible to non floating oils because they tend to exist in the same ripple areas where the salmon um, have reds, and they provide a food source for salmon. So they're, they're a big part of the freshwater um, environment and uh, ecosystem. And um, we also use them to address the issue of um, how, you know impacts that are on a more of a population level. So we look at species diversity and uh, species abundance. How many are there of what species are they? So in healthy systems, you have multiple species there. Um, when your system has been impacted, um, uh, the, the pollution of intolerant species are mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And you hear that those three in that order uh, a lot because they're used as indicators of good water quality. 
What happens when you have spill or you have some siltation resulting from cleanup upstream is you end up with the more uh, a greater proportion of the pollution um, tolerant species. So by looking at the community structure for these organisms, you can get an idea of what the impacts are from your from your spill. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, these are the adult forms. What you see for the ones on the rocks are the um, larval forms. But this is what the adults look like. And some of you who fly fish may notice that these are what your what your flies that you tie um, look like. And um, it's all part of their their um, it's all part of you know that ecosystem. And these are a food source. The, the uh, larval forms are a food source for salmon and other um, other fish. So mayflies, stoneflies, castflies are the, um, the uh, pollution intolerant. Um, you want to you don't want to impact these. Organisms. Mm -hmm. So, um, which is good. Um, so, the main take-home message from this is the resources at risk are somewhat different from rock-building walls. They're not just susceptible to the oiling that's going to deposit where they are. Um, they're also susceptible to upstream cleanup because of saltation and other factors. So, um, I guess I shouldn't have even put the slide in. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's okay. uh -huh. Thanks. Carbons as quickly as they would if, if they stayed floating. 
Um, they're also going to weather slowly because depending on depth, you may not have enough sunlight um, to break them down. Um, so that, that causes a great problem. Um, also, they're persistent. Because they're not weathering, they can be on the bottom longer. Uh, so that could lead to chronic exposure for a lot of our organisms. Um, today, though, I'm going to really mostly be showing you stuff about smothering and coating, because that's our big problem for non-floating oils. They get accumulated on the bottom and basically choke out um, anything that's living on the, the bottom surface. And these organisms include anything from like shellfish to, to even uh, bottom-flowing fish. Um, and then one other problem with these, and as I mentioned before, is the possibility of leak suspension. Um, currents, wave weather, um, what have you, could basically stir up these um, accumulated oils, take them down wherever they want to go, re-sediment re back out, and then impact other organisms down, down the way. So in um, following what's kind of been going on this morning, I too am going to go down Storybook Lane with you, um, and today I have four different cases, um, two in the marine environment and two in freshwater environment. And I'm hoping by the end you'll kind of pick up at this, this theme that, that occurs with these not um, burning oils impacting these habitats. Um, so to begin, um, I just want to touch on Costco Busan. Um, basically, this is close, uh, close to us here. Um, we have this tanker here, vessel. Um, who got a nice little slice in its side and um, released intermediate fuel oil. And you'll see that um, most of the cases today are based on this heavy fuel oil. Um, what I want to um, focus on, though, for this film in particular, is that the eelgrass beds in the Bay Area were highly impacted. Now, it doesn't sound like that's anything too um, dramatic. Um, however, there are spawning habitats for specific and so also I want to point out is that these eelgrass beds were roughly two to five meters deep. So we're not too deep in the water column. We're not uh, in shallow habitats, but this um, oil was able to impact um, fairly uh, important spawning habitats. Just to give you um, a picture of this, um, the Pacific herring like to spawn on, actually on the eelgrass beds themselves. It's seen in that picture over here. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, Costco Busan, due to tides and, and currents and just the actions of the bay itself, actually brought the oil down into um, an area where it could actually cook the eelgrass beds. And during that time, Pacific herring were spawning. Um, so we had an effect. So um, we saw aquatic plants being coated. Um, and due to that, we then had this smothering effect on the spawn egg. Um, that led to death. So um, basically, a lot of those eggs did not survive. And all those that did, um, basically hatched very slowly, they had hatching problems, or basically they, they also just gave up. Those that did hatch, though, ended up having these deformities, um, as shown here. This is a skeletal um, deformity, it's final curvature. You see uh, when they, this happens, they don't really survive very long afterwards. Um, there's also indication that they're gill sacs were really bloated and, and impaired, and when that happens to they don't really survive very long. So in this case, we actually see the early life stage impact, and this leads into further um, um, implications for the, the subsequent spawning season. To continue with the marine environment, um, we're going to take you all the way to Spain, um, where the prestige oil still also um, release heavy fuel oil off of this, uh, the coast here, this little Misha coast. 
Um, this one's quite interesting because this vessel mechanically failed. It was being towed to shore somehow during the weather. Not sure how this ever could happen. Broke in half. What? So they really couldn't do anything about that. So it just sank. It sank about 4,000 meters deep. And during that sinking process, a lot of the fuel oil was being released at different depths. So you had surface um, slicks that were coming along shore. You had water columns. Dispersion, and then you also had whatever was basically coming out of the, the vessel as it hit the bottom. Um, and this uh, again was the churning because of the waves and the bad weather, and the temperature also played a role, uh, a role in this as well. And for quite some time, they were actually binding tar aggregates along the continental <coughs> shelf instead <coughs> of them just being picked up from the tanker and moving along through the positive. Um, in this case, um, there was high persistence due to depth, depth, not depth, depth of um, this, the oil itself, and a lot of the benthic species were being found with actually oil uh, exoskeletons and oil in their guts. Um, some of the amphipods were being recovered in Spain as well, and laboratory studies, and there's been a lot of studies on this um, oil in particular, um, has found that juvenile fish were also impacted. They reduced their um, feeding behavior was impacted, and they basically didn't grow because of that. And this is just a picture of kind of what they were um, gathering from, from the benthic zone of the hill. Um, this turned out to have this ecosystem effect where what really was happening was secondary producer species, suspension feeders, and those organisms <coughs> that feed on the trail were actually the ones that were being uh, wrong and impacted the most. And this led to this like two-tier impact on the ecosystem, where there was this bottom-up effect where all the benthic organisms have shifted. There was the there was a change in the abundance of the trophic level, lower trophic level organisms to a more of a hydrocarbon degrading bacteria and other sorts of species. And then other um, bottom dwelling fish were actually moving in because the feeding, um, the, the food sources were actually changing as well. Um, on top of that, just to compound the situation a little more, um, a top down effect was also occurring. So a um, fishing prohibition was put in at the time, and so the top-level predators were actually increasing in biomass. And you know, it's going from the top, it's coming from the bottom, and it's just not a happy, happy environment there. So to move on from the marine, um, we're going to go into the freshwater scene here. Um, the East Walker River uh, still. That happened about here in Monos County, which is also Nevada. It occurred about 16 miles still down the East Walker River. Um, was the fuel oil that was released by this truck that rolled. Um, in most cases, it probably wouldn't have been that big of a problem, except that it was extremely cold. Um, the weather, the environmental conditions at the time played a huge factor in how the oil was behaving. So it basically turned into tar and sand. Um, because of that, uh, the nature of the spill, the um, Fish and Wildlife Supply Bioassessment Lab was called out to do macroinvertebrates um, surveys. And so they did so, and I just want to show you some data. Um, this red arrow here kind of marks the moment of when the spill happened, the location. You can see anything off to the left, it looks like the populations of the invertebrates are really healthy. Anything to the right of the spill, you see that they died off. There was a major decline in the abundance. As it goes back, you can see that um, there's a very short or a very small um, uh, recovery going on, and they didn't even reach any levels that they were going to be able to fill. And this was all within like a period. So during this um, survey, they were actually um, picking up invertebrates that were fully oiled. Um, and most of them were dead. So they, those that were dead and oiled were actually not included in this. So this, 
Um, the studies that they did do with these invertebrates show that, that the oil exposure actually reduced their capability of feeding and it restricted their movements. And if you put that all together, then they become more vulnerable um, actually out in the river. There was also um, observed mortality on juvenile and adult fish in this river, um, mainly because of the feeding reduction. But um, what I want to point out is this, this last bullet here is the formation of anchor ice. And this doesn't necessarily relate to the oil spill itself, but actually relates to the cleanup uh, procedures that were going on at the time. Um, upstream of this is a, is a water dam. Um, and for safe cleaning practices and um, oil removal, they had to slow down the water. So the water slowed so slow that it was forming this bottom up ice. So it kind of just slowed off whenever it was putting it. So although some of this is, is oil related, some of the, the, the human uh, intervention of the oil spills um, also caused an adverse <coughs> And lastly, this is the hot one of the day, um, the Enbridge oil spill that happened in Michigan. Um, and I think a little bit collapsed. So, um, like we've heard before, it did float for a while and then it sank. Um, from what I had found in the research, it actually was not known that it sank for about a week or two. Um, <coughs> that oil then, when they did figure it out, they had to go in and do some dredging. Again, another human, human impact to the habitat. And um, they were they found that the sunken oil actually did remobilize at, at different times as well. And like um, Jackie kind of mentioned with the, the coal um, the coal ag agitation, um, those that went out to do um, sampling of, of the sediment actually did um, resuspend accumulated oil, but then they also created all these sur surface sheets as well. So they, whatever they agitated, just stick back up into the waterfall. So just like every other study, the macroinvertebrates are always highly popular. And in this case, they uh, observed a reduced um, diversity and abundance of the species. Um, again, similar to East Walker River, they went out multiple times, and within a year period, they did see an improvement, but, but because of the remobilization of the oil, um, that wasn't as um, high as the original count. Um, human impacts, though, did in, um, touch on removing of the vegetation when they were dredging as well. And so because they did that, more um, in-stream sunlight was introduced, and that actually changed the benthic macroinvertebrate communities as a whole. So similar to the bottom-up effect where you're enhancing other, other species and other communities, um, something similar would be uh, Like I noted, uh, noted already, removal techniques remove the vegetation, increasing um, predation of um, reducing height. And the burial and smothering of this um, this oil um, buried and smothered other fish in the benthic zone as well. And the mortality for this case was um, many different things, um, many different factors, including dissolved oxygen depletion and um, um, just impacts to, to the physically, such as gill lesions, um, skin lesions, abrasions, hemorrhages, the list goes on. But because it's almost lunchtime, we'll just stop there. <laughs> um, and then they did also, like I mentioned, did see it also a reduction in the biomass for the cats. <clears throat> and just to wrap it up, um, just to summarize all that, it was a lot of information in a very small amount of time. It discussed that a submerged and sunken oil um, can persist a lot longer due to slow weathering, depth, environmental conditions. Um, studies on all of these cases have shown reduced that the community uh, communities um, shifts in the abundances, um, deformities, um, 
never fun on bottom dwelling fish and um, has major impacts on food supply. And of course, death. Um, because of the persistence on, on the, the sediments, um, we may observe long term impacts such as reproduction, reproductive impacts, or um, developmental impacts or change of those um, specific parent embryos. Um, and I didn't touch too much on it, but because of the persistence and the long term exposure, they could end up with. I want to throw that in there, anyways. And there's death again. <laughs> and lastly, just to uh, retouch, it, all of this combined does have a major impact on the ecosystem themselves. Either it's impacting the lower levels or the uh, upper levels. Uh, overall, it impacts it in a way that it slowly recovers in one area or um, actually causes this cascade effect. So with that, um, I will introduce lunch. <laughs> <laughs> that is all I have for you. So we have an hour for lunch. It's a little tight, uh, so we'll do, it, do the best we can. It's raining. Um,